first of all, when I heard the word digital transformation, um, it just completely went over my head. It, was, uh, it sounded like a technology buzzword uh, that marketing folks would use to, you know, put for, to make things look uh, attractive. Uh, I didn't really realize what it was. But after reading about it at um, so many analyst reports, hearing about it at um, uh, several conferences, and also talking about it at WSO2, um, I realized that this is, this is not a buzzword or a, or a phase or a wave. It is really uh, the next revolution. It is like the industrial revolution, but in the digital economy. So any organization that does not adapt and transform themselves uh, within this digital world and this digital economy uh, will, will be obsolete uh, in, in, in the next five to ten years. Uh, but uh, the good news is, uh, as Sanjeeva said, it's, uh, it's, it's a journey to uh, digitally transform your organization. And uh, we are all here to discuss how do we do this. So my key goal from this session is to talk about different uses, uh, use cases and user use stories to inspire you to understand what and how this digital transformation can map to your business in your industry. So if you walk away from this session with a, with a few ideas, a few concrete examples of how you might um, implement this uh, piecemeal in your company or your enterprise, then I think this would be a successful session. All right. So Sanjeeva mentioned Uber a lot. Um, so Uber is a taxi company that doesn't own um, taxis. Uh, we know a few other digital native businesses like that. Uh, Airbnb, the hospitality service that doesn't own uh, uh, any hotels or rooms. Amazon and eBay, uh, who sell stuff that they, they don't own. Uh, StubHub, a ticket reseller uh, who doesn't run any events or uh, any sporting events. Uh, Spot Hero, a parking space provider that doesn't own parking lots. Um, digital native businesses, it, it really sounds cool and it's, it sounds like these guys have done something amazing. Uh, but, and some of you here may be here to understand, okay, how do we start a business like this? But I know that most of you here are not, does not fall into that category. Most of you are from established businesses trying to understand how does this Uberization uh, uh, really um, pan out for me and my business. So I will talk a little bit about how different industries uh, have done this and are doing this and the, and the vision we see uh, to digitally transform different industries. Here are a few examples of established businesses that has already done or already taken some steps towards transforming their um, businesses digitally. Uh, if you take Netflix, if you remember, there used to be uh, a video rental, a, a DVD rental service by post. They, that is no longer their business model. Their business model is video on demand, specializing in providing um, personalized recommendations of entertainment. Uh, if you take Hilti, uh, it's a building construction tools company who, who is a large manufacturing firm uh, founded in 1941. But now they offer um, uh, these building construction tools as a service and they track the usage using IoT sensors. So this is how different established businesses in different industries have transformed themselves digitally. Uh, Safeway is a traditional grocery or a, a traditional supermarket in the US uh, founded in 1915 and just last year their e-commerce portal was um, one of the top 10 um, popular websites in the United States in, in 2016. Um, let's look at Hilton and Starbucks. Um, they have also taken certain steps. If they haven't completely transformed their business, they have taken steps towards transforming their business by providing different services to digital, uh, through digital means to uh, digital audiences. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you, take different industries, and talk to you about how you can digitally transform your industry. 
I'll talk about these five industries, um, and I'll go into detail. I'll take one industry and go into detail about different aspects of the uh, business and how you de how you can perform digital transformation uh, across different aspects of the business. Right. Quick show of hands. How many people uh, are from businesses in f in the finance industry? Okay, great. Four. How many people have a bank account? Okay, so great, because I'm going to talk about finance in detail, and it helps that everyone is familiar with the industry. Now, if you take any business, be it in finance, be it in entertainment, uh, be it in any industry, any business, there are two main things, two main goals to keep your business going and you know, keep it successful. Increase revenue, reduce costs, right? Everything you do will fall under those two things. You want to increase revenue and you want to reduce cost. That is how you will continue to sustain your business and make it successful. I have broken that down into f four, um, uh, another level. So four, um, f four aspects. Grow your business. Increase your revenue by attracting new customers and keeping your customers. Cut your costs by improving operations. And the fourth goal that the digital economy offers us is the ability to now very easily get into new revenue streams. So any industry that identifies, any industry or company that identifies these new uh, digital revenue streams and capitalizes on them will be the trendsetter and will have the largest portion of the pie. So let's get into detail. When we talk about increasing uh, or getting new customers and increasing your brand, your brand name, um, marketing is obviously one of, the, one of the main things that we do uh, to do that. Now, um, a few days ago, I got a text message from, uh, from my bank from one of my banks. Uh, it said, um, here's a new, uh, here's a high interest rate uh, for senior citizens' deposits. <laughs> so when I first got this and I read this, I was offended. I was offended that my bank thought that I'm nearing retirement, right? Um, then on second thought, uh, I was upset because I realized that it's not that my bank thinks I'm old or I'm, I'm nearing retirement. It's that my bank has no idea who I am or where I stand, right? And it hurt me even more that over the years, I have provided them the very same information in terms of know your customer forms, uh, in terms of all the information that the bank has asked from me. Apart from that, my bank also knows Apart from the information that I have given the bank, it also knows uh, it has a better knowledge about my uh, assets and liabilities that is maintained with the bank. It also has a good idea about my lifestyle. Through my uh, credit card purchases, my bank understands what kind of life lifestyle I lead, what kind of products I buy, how often I buy them, in what quantities I buy them, etc. And now, in the digital age, if my bank really wanted to, it could tap into social media feeds and understand even more about me. So my bank has all this information to create a comprehensive profile about myself, maybe, maybe get information that even my spouse doesn't know about me. And it sends me the senior citizen's high interest rate, fail. So how do we, how, how, what does this mean? In the digital world, you use these data streams to understand and profile your customer and market contextually. Um, your bank has information about your demographics, your current situation, uh, your purchase trends, what you tweet about, what you post on Facebook. So use that rich source of in, uh, information to market contextually. On the other side, my bank should also not waste money sending me that uh, 
offer for senior citizens um, interest rate because A, it's a wasted offer, they're spending money on it. B, it is creating alert fatigue where I think this bank is just spamming, with, spamming me with you know, every offer they have and the time that they actually send me a uh, message or an offer that I really care about, it just goes into the spam. Right? So effective conversion ratio is something that the digital world offers uh, organizations. You can, you can uh, monitor how uh, people convert after they are uh, sent offers and promotion emails or text messages. So the idea is to uh, integrate these different systems and take this data into uh, a central place and provide a really good analytics engine which will be able to make that decision contextually. So we're thinking, ex a, a good example would be, I have a customer, I'm a bank, I have a customer who, um, is, who I have seen is uh, tweeting about or putting Facebook posts about buying a car. Uh, and this customer is currently at a car dealership. How do I know this? Because the customer uses my mobile banking application, which shows me uh, the location. That is a good time to send him a message about the um, car loan or uh, an offer you have with that uh, dealership. That is called contextual marketing and that is also called proximity marketing. Marketing, uh, sending advertisements, providing ma uh, branding at that purchase moment. So th this is how, um, this is one aspect of uh, digitally transforming um, how you attract customers. How do you keep your customers? Now for, uh, for organizations in the financial uh, services, churn is a very big problem, right? Um, and we all know, right, any, any layman would know that um, some of these things uh, are telltale signs of a customer going to leave you. So um, if you just go through the different signs. Uh, if a customer has only one account with you or one, one product with you, it's easier for the customer to leave you than if he had multiple uh, accounts having standing orders, etc. Uh, if there's a decrease in assets, if there's a decrease in online banking activity, card purchase activity, then it's a sign that this guy probably is uh, reducing its usage with you. Uh, separately, we could also see whether the customer has had any negative interactions with your call center or with the, with the officials in the branch, or uh, worse yet, if the customer has negatively uh, commented about you on, on social media, which means that you're probably losing the customer as well as lose, might lose other customers uh, who are in that guy's network. So in the digital world, we already, know, we already know this information before the customer leaves us. It is available in, in the static data of our co-banking system or the transactional data. It's available in the credit card system, in the online banking system, or it is available as uh, call center logs or social media feeds. So it is all about now integrating these different systems, uh, putting in triggers, filters and triggers that send you alerts when some of these telltale signs are identified, providing an ability to uh, give weights to each of these signs because complaining on social media is, f is far more serious than owning a single product, right? So you wouldn't want to get the same level of, same severity of alerts for the two. So providing weights to uh, these different telltale signs and um, and basically alerting someone so that a retention offer could be uh, provided before the customer leaves you. And that retention offer as well needs to be customized for that particular use case, that particular reason that the customer is leaving. If the customer is finding it difficult to do something uh, through the uh, online banking facility, there's no point in offering him a high senior citizen's interest rate, right? Um, so uh, the digital transformation story for keeping new customers is basically to identify, to use the rich source of data that you have already about them and identify certain patterns and act proactively rather than reactively. So when it comes to um, minimizing costs, 
and improving operations. Detecting fraud is uh, one of the main things for uh, banks and financial institutions. Here, once again, we move from um, our previous world of uh, rule-based um, end-of-day fraud detection mechanisms to real-time queries where we are able to identify fraud either before it happens or at least while it's happening so that someone can do something about it before it is too late, before it, it, it's gone into the books. So the idea is to convert domain knowledge about possible um, behaviors of fraud into real-time rules which are contextual and time-bound. Any rules that uh, we write during um, a normal period will not be applicable during uh, a, a different season where there are seasonalities and trends. So your rules have to be, they cannot be static, they have to be adapting by themselves, dynamically. And uh, a, a, a fraud detection mechanism uh, also needs to be able to identify types of frauds that, that domain experts still don't know about. Because uh, fraudsters are um, improving their methods of um, uh, their, their fraudulent means every day. So uh, being able to employ machine learning technologies, machine learning algorithms to classify, to, for it to learn what normal behavior has been so far and when uh, a, a behavior which is away from that normal behavior happens, that machine learning algorithm need to be able to give an alert in real time for somebody to, for a fraud analyst to really go and identify what is going on. Uh, separately, also uh, use uh, things like Markov models, which enable uh, finding fraud that is hidden amongst multiple transactions. Uh, international crime rings, when they uh, commit fraud, they don't do it with one, tra one big transaction. They break it down into smaller transactions, uh, distributed geographically so that it cannot be traced. But using things like Markov models, uh, where you understand the probabilities of event sequences happening, you can identify these things. So this is the digital, uh, digital transformation of doing the operations that we used to do uh, much better. Um, another thing to, uh, when we talk about improving operations, is basically using the data that is generated at, at each of the touch points, each of the customer's touch points, and basically optimizing everything, be it call center command sequences, or queues at branches, or ATM cache loading, whatever it is, whatever the data that you get, use machine learning algorithms, use real-time real, uh, real queries to optimize how things are done now. <coughs> and finally, um, within finance, um, uh, how do you generate new, new uh, revenue streams? Now, I already mentioned your bank knows about you m probably much more than your spouse does. So what is your bank doing about it? How, is, how should the bank make money with that information? Sell it to your wife <laughs> or your husband. Or sell it to other parties that are able to uh, use that information or use that insight to uh, make better business decisions. So for example, your bank already knows your card purchase trends, uh, whatever uh, assets and liabilities that you have, your bill payment trends, your demographics, etc. Sell, um, aggregate that information. They know that for each customer, aggregate that information and sell it to retailers, sell it to um, hospitality services, sell it to um, car dealerships, other entities that can make use of that information, trends, seasonalities, um, times at which uh, people sh uh, they should advertise to their customers, etc. All right. Um, now I'm just going to go through um, the other four industries. Uh, within, uh, in the interest of time, I won't be able to go into detail uh, of these industries um, so much. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, larger use cases that will hopefully inspire you to think. Um, digital transformation for each industry. So when, it, uh, when we uh, talk about retail and e-commerce, 
this is this is very common, right? This we are we are very used to this now. If we if we don't see this, we feel ah, oh, why haven't they thought of this before, right? We are used to this. We know this. Um, uh, every time you buy something online, you expect uh, your that e-commerce uh, e portal to tell you, okay, what else can you buy with that? But what about your groceries? Um, this is very similar to something I would write. Of course, I have better handwriting than this. Um, so when we go shopping for, for the weekend, uh, we, we buy different things. We buy certain things uh, on a weekly basis, like vegetables and fruits and uh, meat and uh, milk, maybe. And then there are certain things we buy bi-weekly. And then there are certain things we buy after we get our salaries. Right, things, per, things uh, that we buy for the month, etc. And then, at certain times, we buy things for that season. During Christmas, we would buy Christmas pudding. Right, we would buy Easter eggs before Easter. Uh, and also, if there is a uh, Sri Lanka England um, cricket ODI coming up, we might buy some popcorn. Right. So um, I do. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the idea is, how do you, how, how do you uh, digitally transform this experience for that customer? Think digital shopping list, right? Uh, whether your customer is, is someone who comes to your store or is someone who buys uh, your products online, provide a digital shopping list so that these things are pre-populated for the, for the customer. Um, the idea is once you w once you maintain a relationship with a customer, regular customer who who, who gives you that information through either the online uh, the e-commerce portal or through your mobile app, which they can use while they're at the store, you already know the frequency of purchases of this guy. Separately, you also know what are the seasonal seasonal goods that are going out right now. What are the events that are coming up? What are, what are people buying because there are certain sporting events or uh, things like that coming up? So you should collate that information and make a personalized shopping list for your customers. If a supermarket is doing this for me, I will forever go to that supermarket and not anywhere else, right? Uh, separately, you, can, you also benefit from this because now you are, you are you're maintaining this shopping list for different people. You understand purchase trends, you understand demand, and you're, be, you're able to better optimize your, um, your operations for that. You can not only uh, optimize your operations, you can maybe use that to, to optimize your product placement in the supermarket. And you can maybe provide that as an option in the mobile app for your customer can I sort this uh, in terms of aisles for you so that you just keep buying without having to go back and forth? Uh, and also, you can provide that, you can use that information to suggest other brands and other products that may earn better profit margins for you. Another use case of, uh, in, uh, for retail and e-commerce is where you um, expose APIs of your retail, of your um, purchase, um, your e-commerce portal to other businesses, right? So there could be other businesses like restaurants, hospitals, uh, corporate offices buying uh, stock from you regularly. So if you can expose your purchase uh, process as an API, the inventory management systems of these um, entities like the uh, hospitals and uh, restaurants, etc., can directly talk to your API without a human being having to check the inventory system and then placing that order personally. So this not only makes the business much more seamless, it will also get you more customers because someone who opens up their APIs for another system to talk to is much more interesting and attractive to other digital businesses. All right, let's move on to telecommunication. If banks knew more about you than your spouse did, telcos know more about you than you think they do. Um, first of all, just like the uh, banks and financial institutions, you do provide them with a certain level of information. 
maybe uh, maybe your address, maybe your um, uh, where you your uh, where you work, etc. But it also has information about your browsing history. Uh, it has information about your demographics. Uh, it, if, if, if it tries, it has information about your wealth category. It will always have information about your location and where you, the, the places you frequent. So this is once again a very rich source of uh, revenue for telcos, new revenue streams for telcos. So the idea is that just like in the use case that we spoke about, about the banks, uh, open up APIs for other uh, businesses to use this. Not only the aggregated information that you can expose out, but also offer services to uh, businesses where they pay you to um, send uh, text messages or um, e uh, yeah, basically text messages to telco com uh, consumers based on context and proximity. So think, for example, uh, the telco knows where you work, where you live. It knows the route you take to go home. And it knows what you have been searching online for. So if you were looking for a particular product, and if it is available in the supermarket on your way home, you charge, the telco charges the supermarket to send that text message to that guy before he leaves, home from, uh, leaves work to go home. So those are the new uh, revenue streams available to digital businesses. Another example for uh, te telcos is basically to become that uh, digital identity that Sanjeev was talking about earlier. Now, this is something we have available in Sri Lanka as well. Um, uh, the, the telco becomes a digital identity to provide services of other industries. So healthcare, for example, we have the ability to, uh, the, the telcos basically provide the ability to link channeling services with the doctors and um, associate the payment involved so that when I need to see a particular doctor at a particular hospital on a particular time and need to make the payments to the different parties for it, all I do is I just log onto my phone and I just put, I just use the mobile app and say, I want to see this doctor in, at this lot at this time. It arranges everything for me, it in integrates between all these systems puts the appointment, uh, pays the channeling guy, pays the hospital, pays the doctor, and that uh, fee gets deducted from my monthly bill. That's it. Government. Right. So anyone here who started a business, their own business? Anyone who didn't do it because the process is really long? <laughs> so if you really want to start a business, uh, this is just, I think, one-tenth of the things that you have to do, right? You need to get a business license, you need to register company vehicle, tenancy contracts, employees, imports, exports. And the fun is when you have to deal with different, uh, different entities, government departments, provide the same information most of the time. Uh, send back and forth documents from, obtained from this department to the other one, uh, etc., and also have to uh, authenticate yourself every time you deal with a um, different entity. Some, what some of our uh, uh, customers in the government space have done is basically completely change the system, completely change the experience for, for its citizens and its uh, businesses of that country by exposing or by making available those interactions with different entities as microservices and exposing them as APIs, which is then accessible through one application or one portal, which uh, gives you access to these different applications, which in turn uses services from these different entities. So for example, you authenticate once into this um, single government portal, and then you say, I want to start a business. What that does for you is it gives you an application which says, OK, these are the steps you need to do. And you just follow this process. And the same information is used for different entities. The only difference is that the, the, the citizen or the, or the businessman only enters it once, has a seamless uh, journey in starting the business, and is happy at the end of the day. 
So that is about making the citizens happy and staying in power, right? Uh, the other end of things is how you use that information. If you have that inform if you if you capture that information in one place, then you have that information available for your government decision making, whether it be uh, reforms or uh, the next government budget. You have this rich source of data in one place, uh, comprehensive data, without having to request data from different departments in order to make the decision. And last of all, healthcare. Um, healthcare is different in different countries. Uh, and then there is the public healthcare and the, and the private healthcare. But in any instance or in any country, what we see is that from the day we are born, we uh, see different doctors, we see them at different facilities, we go to different laboratories to get different uh, tests done, different reports done. And we have so many different interactions with different parties. Um, when you have uh, an illness and the next time you need to go to the doctor, you usually have to, um, the, the, the facility that you will go to will have the interactions that you have had with them, but not of those that you have had with the others. But the, the digital transformation for healthcare is where you provide the ability to integrate these different systems by exposing data as APIs with the uh, permission of the patient, enabling uh, any person s sitting in any of these entities to request for the comprehensive uh, report of data about this, this patient's medical uh, history and make um, much more comprehensive and much more informed medical decisions based on this person's uh, past medical health. Furthermore, if you uh, focus on one particular hospital, uh, we use this, digi we, we, we use this um, digital transformation to then transform how we track the patient's journey within that facility or within that hospital. Uh, if you have heard about HL7, uh, healthcare level seven messaging. It is basically um, a, a, a way to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a data standard where you capture each and every point of the journey of a patient within your hospital uh, in, in one way so that you can really go through the service and uh, go through the journey and see, okay, what's happening? Where, where are the gaps? What does, does this guy need to be prioritized? So for example, a, a patient comes to the hospital, the hospital knows, okay, this is the time he had got admitted to the hospital. These are the initial symptoms he had. This is the first doctor he saw. These were his observations. He is now scheduled to go for a, get these lab reports done. And he's been waiting in queue for the last one and a half hours. Should he be prioritized or or not, or should he be sent to a different facility so that this can be done faster? In the same way, you use you can also use that information to better optimize the um, f uh, healthcare facilities operations. For example, uh, certain hospitals use this data to optimize their um, intensive care units. Sometimes the intensive care units are overloaded, and there are patients who are really critical who, who can't get in. So using the, da using the monitoring data, it is, uh, the, the analytics engines are able to suggest to a doctor certain candidates who can be uh, deprioritized or sent to a ward based on their current situation. So the analytics engine doesn't take that decision, but it helps the doctor by filtering the candidates that he needs to, ex uh, he needs to assess to make room for much more critical patients. Right, so that was a lot of user stories. And here's a lot of customers who <laughs> are involved or, or we have worked with uh, in order to digitally transform their businesses. That's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Also, if you are from an industry that, is, that I did not cover, uh, I'm always welcome to have a chat with you later on in the day. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for a very informative uh, presentation.
overview. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is more about the opportunities available for the smaller businesses there. Mm -hmm. Like how they can benefit, how they can benefit from this all digital transformation wave and what uh, how uh, they can basically how they can expand their businesses mm -hmm. basically because mostly these are the larger organizations who can afford to uh, basically uh, implement these type of large transformations. So what about the smaller businesses, how they can contribute and manifest? Yeah, great. So the question is, how can smaller businesses um, digitally transform themselves uh, as opposed to or large organizations? Sorry? Or contribute. Or contribute, OK. So it's actually, um, it's much easier for smaller organizations to digitally transform themselves than it is for uh, large organizations. Because with large organizations, you, they are already, they have certain business processes in place. They have certain cultures built up, which is difficult to penetrate sometimes. And you, you will know that if you speak to some of, uh, some of the larger businesses that we have worked with, um, it's, it's not that easy to digitally transform because of uh, the, the status quo. Whereas the smaller businesses, it is much easier because it is a it, it, it is a fewer number of people that you need to convince, and it is much easier and agile uh, to make the decision. Separately, how do they do it? This is where open source comes into play, right? Open source technology is available not just to the large organizations, but very specially to small organizations who can do low cost uh, transformations. Uh, you know that you, that they like to do. So if you're if you're thinking, um, so once again, it's 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 an industry-based thing. So if you're thinking about a, uh, let's say a small um, restaurant, right? Um, how do they change their customers' experience? So if they are um, maybe enabling customers to um, pay through their, uh, let's say, telco, right? They walk in and say, I have this. I'm an O2 customer, and I, I want to, I want to add this bill to my, uh, b uh, to my uh, telco bill at the end of the month. Then make that available, right? Integrate that. Integrate your service with a telco and provide that uh, service to your customer. So it's a, it's a case by case thing, but it's much easier for small organizations to benefit from and contribute to digital transformation than it is for large organizations. I, 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 um, I spoke about the larger organizations because it, it, people can relate to it much more than the small organizations. I'm happy to ha have a chat with you if you have a particular uh, enterprise in mind. Don't you think that uh, the, the, the example that we have just given, the restaurant, don't you think it's a difficult for them to basically computerize their systems and then the, use these APIs gateways to open, the, open their services to the, to, the, to the larger companies like telcos? Is it, not, is it that challenging for those smaller companies like restaurant? Because they need to build the ecosystem to, uh, to have the API gateway and then the, and the team that may be maintaining that API gateway. So do you think that is a feasible for these smaller res companies like restaurants? Absolutely, it is. Uh, it, it is not difficult. It is. It is a very reason, in my opinion, it is a very reason that it is easier for them because uh, it's it's a very quick decision. You you're an organization with, uh, let's say, 10, 20 staff in your company, in your organization. You have less people to convince. Open source software is available to you, so you don't need to uh, invest a large amount of your revenues on that. And you, you, you just make a partnership or you just become a WS2 customer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you use the service. It's, um, it's, it's a lot easier, uh, if you really think about it, for small organizations to do it because they, ha it's, they, they don't have baggage. Right? Baggage is not an issue, but again, the capex and opex, the initial amount they need to invest. It's, it's not a lot. Size. It's not a lot. You have. Let's say you have you, you maintain all your records in Excel, yeah. right? You take a data you you take an analytics engine that reads data from uh, CSV. You uh, just take the analytics engine, read data from CSV, put some filters in there. And I'll tell you how to do that with uh, WSO2 data analytics server. <laughs> uh, put some filters in there, right? Says okay, customer walks in. Um, 
you know, this is this kind of, so let's, say, let's say, okay, he doesn't have a mobile app or anything, right? Customer walks and says, this is my name, right? Or this is my whatever, um, priority customer number or whatever. You put that into your system. Your data analytics engine grabs the data from uh, the CSV, uh, figures out which category he belongs to, has some, I'm, I'm just making a yeah, use yeah, case here, right? Yeah. It may not be the way, best digital transformation for that restaurant. Um, has some filters that says, okay, this guy is a vegetarian uh, and doesn't, uh, he's, he's non-alcoholic, right? Don't provide the uh, bar, um, the alcoholic beverage menu to that guy. It's very easy. It's, it's, it, this digital transformation, once again, is, is True, the, the use cases that I spoke about are for the large organizations because you know, when we talk about it, it, it makes, it, it's, more, it's easier to understand when you, you talk in the bigger sense. But for smaller organizations, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just about improving uh, piecemeal, improving your current uh, operations and improving how you do in little ways. So that, that simple example of customer walking in and making a... Uh, informed decision about the kind of service you offer to that guy is a very basic querying of data from your CSV and a very basic output. It's, uh, and with open source technology, obviously, let it be uh, WSO2, let it be something else. Uh, it's, uh, there is no CapEx involved. Right. Any more questions? I think we can move on to the next session otherwise. Any other questions from Sashi? One more? What? So with respect to using the customer data, you know, there's quite a lot of privacy concerns. Yes. And you know, the new regulations coming up. Yeah. So how do you see, you know, uh, businesses approach that? Uh, yeah. You know, the last thing you want to do is yeah. find Irk your customers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, the answer is twofold. Um, firstly, uh, some, of the, some of the use cases I uh, mentioned, especially with regards to monetizing your data, is you are not, uh, you're not providing, basically your data is anonymized. It's aggregate data. It's aggregate trends and seasonalities. So therefore, there is no um, person, uh, personal information that gets um, uh, propagated from your organization. So that's the first thing. Right? Make money out of aggregate insights. Second thing is where you collaborate with the customers. For the customers who wish to share their data in order to uh, obtain this new service, then take their uh, approval and then provide that service. So um, you, you would find, and we have found in some of the, uh, some of the projects that we've done, um, cust th there are a lot of customers who are willing to offer that data for that specialized service uh, that the uh, enterprise can offer them. So those are the two ways in which uh, I can think of. <laughs>